Japan, have you attended part one on Sunday? Oh, awesome. That's fantastic. Okay. Well, I guess we'll all introduce ourselves. I'm Don Mango. Uh, I currently run my own firm in a venture which is in the insure tech world, and I also teach at Columbia. I'm just a lowly adjunct, unlike Professor Milton Hall, who's a real professor. And I'm going to introduce uh, this great panel. I think we all had uh, a meeting of the minds six months or so ago and said, you know, we really would be great to leverage a kind of multi-session format and really try to give a treatment to this that flows with examples. And Stephanie was our guide on whipping us into shape and giving us proper learning objectives. So, uh, this is not a dark side of the moon retrospective. This is uh, the most important risk measures you've never heard of, which are, are known officially as spectral risk measures or unofficially distortion or dual utility. You may have heard those other terms used. And we have learning objectives, right? We're gonna help you understand what these are all about with examples that Jesse has uh, built in Excel per the, per the CAS regulations. They have to be done in Excel and then how to really apply them and, and between today and tomorrow we're gonna to relate them all to the cost of capital. And I don't actually know, is that a Hyperloop? Is that the test of Hyperloop there, John? John is major is our graphics guy. I don't know, it looks like a theme park ride. Something, you know. So, we're gonna uh, we're gonna rewind and slow the movie down quite a bit here uh, because it's important to understand the the what spectral risk measures are really doing. It's it's important for us to, to almost back up a little bit. So we're gonna first start with what is a risk measure? And technically speaking, in in very formal mathematical terms, it it maps a distribution to a real number. Is that a, is that a correct? I have to confirm that John and Steve, right? That's a risk measure, right? What are some examples of risk measures? Well, we're gonna go through some of these, and some of these you may not have known were actually risk measures. And what are they used for? I think we all know that. So, we start with the probability distribution, and at least in my, and by the way, my role on this panel, which I've told these two in particular from the start, is I'm gonna be your translator. So if at any point the mathematics is getting too heavy, the sledding is too, too steep, I'll be at that far end. Raise your hand. Don't worry. I'll do my best with, with uh, adding color commentary. Um, I always think on the probability distribution and risk measurement side, there's amount and there's likelihood. And that's the, that's the real variables that we're trying to deal with here and people's perceptions and, and how the risk measures are applied or whatever is just some variation on that. So actually, we're going to look at three simple examples on our way to kind of teeing up the, the spectral risk measures. And the first one being mean, right? Sorry about that, what we're doing. And then VAR and T-VAR. Well, why are these three all different? And you may not have even thought mean was a, was a risk measure, but it sure enough is. Uh, every risk measure is an implicit expression of risk preference. Right? So you're taking the distribution and doing the transform uh, in some different manner. So lots of people don't think of mean as a risk measure. It's 100% a risk measure. It is 100% neutral with respect to amount and probability. It says, I just take the weighted average of the amounts and their probabilities, and I'm good. That fully captures risk. I like to think of it, does this thing move if the situation changes? The answer is yes. If you give me one distribution that's riskier in your mind or my mind than another, will the means be different? Maybe, probably, whatever. Or if something happens to a distribution that we think should make it riskier, will the mean move? Probably. Okay, but fairly clumsy, granted. Value at risk. I, I know that I started six or eight years ago putting something like this that we cleaned up a little bit, but um, I, I always. Uh, presented this by saying if a super intelligent space alien came to a company that uses VAR and tried to figure out what that company's risk preferences were and they had VAR then the alien would say well it looks like you, all of your focus is on one point I like to another simple way I've thought of this is that if you're trying to keep track of an anaconda 
and you're looking through a paper towel tube, right? So, you, you know, as long as you're looking at one spot on that anaconda and you keep track and you follow that one spot, will you know where the anaconda is? Sure. Okay? That one spot had better be the right spot, right? And again, I think this one only works. A lot of this came out of the time when we did not have computers and simulation modeling and we used closed form. So as long as we can go, you know what, everything's log normal, then cool. Then you're okay with this because of the picking one VAR point is the same as knowing the standard deviation is the same as knowing the distribution, right? But this notion of like not caring anywhere except that one point is really the key. So then TVAR came and fixed everything, thank goodness, uh, except when you speak to a board of management and you say, hey, you're using TVAR. Did you know that behind TVAR, implicitly what you're saying is your, your level of concern, once you enter the red zone, right, which is cross over that key VAR threshold, does not get any worse. In fancy economics talk, I think this would be, there's no nonlinear externalities out in the tail. Well, we're going to show in a minute, I think you all can tell that that's not the case. If you think, for example, that this point here the 90, VAR 95 point constitutes we're losing 10% of our capital, let's say, or 5%, and then you think about every additional 5% that we lose as we move further and further out into the T-VAR zone. If you want to tell your management, by the way, we're no, we're no more concerned about losing between 10 and 15, 15 to 20, 25 to 30, 35 to 40, 45, so on. The further, no more concerned, sir, ma'am, board members, nope equally bad. Once we're in the red zone, it's all equally bad. There's just no management team I've ever worked with that, that would accept that philosophy, if you will. So what kind of events might management be concerned about? Well, there's tons of research on this, and this is based on uh, actually uh, work that I did with Terry Delenta at Allstate. And this was great innovative work that the Allstate folks did in trying to take the theory and put it into a digestible form where we could get their management team on board. So we came up with three zones, we called them, right? Which is, hey, we don't make earnings. They're publicly traded. That's an issue, right? Hey, if you want to call ratings watch losing 10% of capital, right? So we, hey, we don't make earnings. Okay, not great. All right, how about we lose 10% of capital, we go on ratings watch. I know it's not, I know it's worse than not than losing earnings. How much worse, okay? Hey, how about 20% loss of capital where we get a multiple rating notch downgrade, okay? I know it's worse than the, than the middle section and I know that that's worse than the first section. How much worse? When we were coming up with this, John Major used to, used to call it curvature, right? Wasn't that the term, right? So this is a simple version of what we're really going to dig into here on, on the spectral measures, okay? But keep this example in your mind because this is the easiest way I have found to kind of get your head around the why are we doing Why? What are we doing here? What are we doing? This is not about the mathematics, okay? It's about management concern, the use test, risk committee, board, right? People steering the company and giving them something, something meaningful. That's my fancy logo. There we go. All right, I'm handing it to Steve. <laughs>